So can somebody name one of the lines in that bottom plane? Um, plane or line in. Okay? So that's that's one. Now what we talked about yesterday um, was that I like it when you just use that one cursive letter, line N like that. Don't call it N G. Um, I know that there's N and G on the picture, but N is not a coordinate or it's not a point, it's just the name of the line. So this one, since it only has one dot, I would just use the letter N. So line N. Okay, what about the other line that we have? Q. Line Q? Okay. So line Q. Okay, these are the acceptable ways you write that. Now, on line Q, do you notice it has the two points on it? Has H and L? You could call it the two letter system as well. So instead of calling it line Q, you could call it HL or LH, but you have to have the arrows above it. Okay, I don't know if we got to that point yesterday or I was talking about that, but you, you have to make sure that you have the arrows above it if you do the two letter system. Not three letters, it's two letters for lines. Because if you forget that line, like that, that little arrow thing above it, I do count it wrong. That's not a line, that's a segment. Okay, I wanted lines, very specific. Okay, any questions with the top one? Okay, second one, how many planes are on the picture? How many individual planes are there? Two. Two, okay. Uh, number three, so there's two here. Name a plane that contains lines M and T. So lines M and T, there's M and T, so what's that plane called? R. Plane R, okay? So you just write plane R. Notice that I wrote the word plane and then wrote the R. Now, that's if you use the cursive letter. If you don't choose the cursive letter, you could do the three-letter system, where, you know, if you don't have these italicized letters in the corners, you could give it three letters that are on the actual plane itself. So pick any three points on that plane R. Any three. A, C, E, okay, that works. So you could call this plane A, C, E. They 
They just have to be three points on the actual plane and preferably not in a straight line. So like I wouldn't say BCF. I wouldn't pick those three. Those are in a straight line. I can pick any of the other three though. I would have picked ABC. Just keep it easy. But um, planes you can use as many letters as you want. It has to be a minimum of three uh, when you write a plane. But I prefer the cursive letter on the corner because it's easier without them. Okay, any questions with the top three so far? Okay, what's the intersection of line M and T? Where do they cross? Point C. And you have to write it point C. That's the intersection of two lines. When two lines cross, they make a single point, a singularity. Okay, uh, when planes cross, they make lines. So if you ever had a picture where there's two lines or two planes crossing, it would form an entire line. So intersections are important that you know how to answer it. There's only two options. It's a point or it's a, or it's a line. Okay, what's another name for line T? CE, you're doing the two letter system, CE, and what do I need above it? Yeah, the little arrows, because it's a, they want another name for a line, not a segment. Okay. okay, any questions with number one? On semester test day, you'll have just kind of a random picture that you've seen before, and a series of questions about it. It'll be something very similar to this. Okay, any questions, comments, concerns on what you're going to need to do on the first problem? Again, this is the practice guide. This looks almost identical to the actual test. Same numbers of questions, same layout, that all that. Okay, let's move on. Okay, let's go to number two now. All right. Okay, number two. Find the distance between each pair of points. So now this is where you have to use your distance formula. So we had two distance formulas. We had one for if it's on a number line, where you just basically just look at you know the bunny leaves. And then there's this one. This distance formula is this, so if you don't remember it. Subtract the x's, square it, subtract the y's, and square it. And then it's all under a square. Or if we had a different one, it was the Pythagorean theorem. That's what we did back in chapter one. Okay, or chapter, yeah, chapter one. Way, way, way back. So it's either or. They're basically the exact same formula if you don't understand that. Okay, so we're trying to find the distance from L to M. Okay, um, it is a di diagonal line, so this may not be a pretty number. It may be like a square root or a decimal. Um, so I prefer that you have, that you use that formula. That formula will probably be on the board somewhere on the semester test day. Okay, it'll be written up there. I won't tell you how to use it. It'll just be on the board, so you need to know how. Okay, so how this works, these are my x and y coordinates. It doesn't matter the order you subtract them. Um, what I mean by that is because you're going to square them anyway. You're going to square the actual parentheses. So when you square it, it turns positive anyway. So when I actually subtract the x's, um, my x numbers are negative 2 and 4. I can subtract them in any <coughs> order I want. So, because it won't matter. Negative 2 minus the 4. Because I'm going to square it. And then the y numbers are the negative 3 and the 0. So, negative 3 minus 0. And I'm going to square that. That's how we're going to find distance. Does that make sense? Like where I'm getting the numbers from? X coordinates and the y coordinates. And then this turns out to be negative 6. Because negative 2 minus 4 more. We'll square that here in a minute. Uh, negative 3 minus 0 is negative 3. I'll square that. So this turns out to be 6, uh, negative 6 squared is negative 6 times negative 6, which is 3, 6. And negative 3 squared is negative 3 times negative 3, which is 9. And when I add these together, that's 45. And the square root of 45 is not quite 7. It's like 6.5, say. Oh, I know that 49 is 7 times 7, so it's not quite 7. Um, 6 times 6 is 36. So somewhere in between 49 and 36, the square root. So it's somewhere in between 6 and 7. So so roughly, let's say it's 6.5. And again, on a calculator, you can just type in the square root of 45 and it will give you the decimal. Really, this is the exact answer I'm looking for. But if you want to type in the calculator and kind of give me a rough decimal approximation, that's fine. Back to people want to know what that number is. Uh, let's see, square root 45, 6.7 actually, 
Now that's approximation. We calculated those using the exact answer. Okay, any questions with how I just did that? Okay, that's the distance. It's actually like 6.7 units long. Units are this length. That's a unit on this graph. So it's 6.7 of those going, going over. Even though it doesn't look like it, it is. Okay, so that, that'll be question number two. It'll be something very similar. I'll give you a new picture. You have to go find the actual uh, the actual distance there. Okay. All right. Okay. Number three. You have to name the vertex of angle four. So you have to name the vertex of angle four. Uh, you have to find the sides of angle three. Name another uh, another name for angle two. What's another name for angle U X Y? Uh, that's the three-letter system when they call it for angles. And then um, name two angles that are adjacent to each other. This I, there's so many different possibility of combinations of things I could put here. I could ask for linear pair, which is basically two angles that are next to each other like this, but they make a straight line. Um, I could ask for obtuse angles or acute angles or right angles if there's any on the picture. Um, so you got to be kind of like ready that I'm going to ask you a series of questions about angles, and you have to name them. Okay, so uh, what is the vertex of angle four? So find angle four. What's the letter that's right next to it? U. U. Okay. So it's point U. That's the vertex. It's a point. Point U. Okay. Uh, what are the sides of angle three? So we found angle three. Angle three is right here. So what are the walls of angle three? So, so give me one of the walls. WX, okay. So WX, that's one of them, that's one of the walls. I prefer that since angle three is here, that you give me the wall like that. So it's like a ray, X to W, with the arrow going towards W. Okay, and then what's the other wall? XU, okay. XU and the arrow is going towards U, this way. Because I want, where three is, that's where the vertex is, so put like, when you write the ray, the dot is right at, right at the x. Because the x is the actual vertex of angle 3. Okay. Does this make sense with, like, the walls? Walls are, like, rays. Okay. Uh, another name for angle number 2. So angle 2 is over there. So give me another name. Now, you can't use the single letter system. Don't say, like, angle Y. You can't do that. The reason why, uh, angle Y, there's, like, four angles there. If you can see it, where angle two is sitting. There's angle two, there's the angle over here, there's angle up here, and angle down here. So if you need to give me angle two, you have to give me the three letter system. So what are the what are the three letters that make that? X, Y, U. X, Y, U. Yeah. So angle X, Y, U. Because Y has to be the middle letter, it's the vertex. You start here at X, go towards U. You could have wrote U, Y, X, that's fine. But notice how I have to use the three letter system. That, that definitively tells me how to draw the angle, where I start, where I finish. Okay, what's another, what's another name for U, X, Y? So let's follow the letters here. So I need another name for U, X, Y. So U towards X towards Y. So what's another name for that angle right here? Angle one, so angle number one. That's how you write it. Notice the little angle symbol. Um, name two angles that are adjacent to each other. So angles that are right next to each other, side by side. You can give me the numbers, you can give me letters, it doesn't really matter. So two angles that are side by side that are literally touching each other. One and three. One and three, yep. So angle one and angle three. Those are angles that are side by side, they're next to each other. Now, you could have given me the three letter system, that would have been a little more complicated, but you could have done that. So you, for angle three, you could have said W, X, U. W X U, that's angle three, and angle Y X U. Those are the same letters, the same angles. Um, I could have picked um, really, I could have picked other options, but those are probably the easiest. Um, just to look at the picture, that's the easiest ones to see. If I wanted a linear pair, I would have probably picked these two. I would have picked angle number two and this angle right here. 
that's a linear curve, they made a straight line. So angle two and the other angle on this side is, uh, there's no number there, so I'd have to call it U, Y, Z. So those have been, those have been a linear pair, supplementary, if you will. Okay, questions with number three? Okay, at least something like that, I'll give you just kind of a random picture, of something you've definitely had before, and just a series of questions about it. About angles. Uh, now, we'll keep going since we have a little more time here. Um, I'm going to try to at least get through the next two. Let's try to get through the next two problems. So, okay, so angle number, or problem number four here. You have to name the type of polygon. So remember the different names of polygons. There was triangle, quad, pentagon, hexagon, septagon, octagon, nonagon. Decagon, pentadecagon, and dodecagon, there's like different names, and then after that, you call them 13 gun, 14 gun, 15 gun. Um, but once you named it, then you have to tell me um, is it convex or concave? That means does it have like a mouth, a cavern, or is it just very big and billowy? And is it regular or irregular? Regular means all the walls are the same and all the angles are marked the same. Um, I can tell you right now, are any of the angles marked on any of those pictures? So they're probably irregular, both of them are. Okay, I can just tell you that right now, since the angles aren't marked. This one had all the walls marked, but the angles are all different, so it's not regular. So both of them are irregular. So they're both irregular. That one didn't even, wasn't even close. Okay, um, they are both concave. They're both concave. You don't need to write arrows when you do it, you write the names. Uh, the reason why they're concave, they have cavities. Have cavities, you know, caverns, mouths, caves. Um, con convex looks like this. They're big, fluffy pillows. There's no, there's no like weird cavern on it, a cavity, like a an indent into it. They're big and billowy. So, uh, but the names of these, how many walls are there? Look at that. So they're both concave. Yeah. They're both irregular. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this one has seven walls. What do we call that? There's two names for this one. What do we call it? It's got seven. That's the name. I'll go through the names again. Triangle, quad, pentagon, hexagon, septagon, octagon, nonagon, decagon. Yeah. What is it? What is it? Septagon. Yeah. So septagon. It's got seven sides. <coughs> septagon or heptagon. That's another way you can call it. Okay. That's the two names. I've seen it in different different books. Okay. And over here, what do we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there's 11 walls. So what's that called? Yeah, I'll keep going. So we have octagon, nonagon, <coughs> decagon, hen decagon, and dodecagon. Hen decagon. Now, hen means one more than 10. <coughs> so hen decagon. Okay, so that's what, that's what I'm looking for. You should have three answers on each picture. So you have to tell me the name, so you might want to say those. Um, you have to tell me, is it concave or convex? And then is it regular or irregular? Most pictures are usually irregular, most of them are. Um, just because usually, it's very rare that you ever have all the walls and all the angles being the same. So, okay, questions on number four. It'll be something like that, two pictures, I'll give you the names, all that good stuff. Okay, that's something you might want to study. No one was really quick on naming those. Okay, uh, let's see, and probably the last problem today. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna tell if this statement is true or false, just right off the bat. Um, write the converse of it. Write the inverse and the contrapositive. Okay. 
So we'll kind of go through what each of those mean, and we have to tell if each each one of those sentences is true or false. So those are so there's a bunch of different answers here. So this is worth quite a few points. This one problem. So it's kind of testing your knowledge on all the different types of conditional statements. Okay. I believe conditional statements were September two. Because I think the last one was chapter one still. I think this is the beginning of chapter two. Let's see conditional statements. Yeah, it's chapter two. It's like um, it's section um, two 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 three. So those are all the that's where these came from. Chapter two. All right. So is this statement true or false? X squared is equal to four. Then X has to be a negative two. True or false? That X has to be a negative two. If X squared is equal to four. Okay. Now, don't get me wrong. That is probably this. The math works, right? That you can plug in the negative two here and square it, and that gives you four, right? Because squaring something means you take negative two times itself, and that does give you four. But the problem is, does it have to be a negative two the entire time? No, because it could have been positive two, and it would still have worked. So this is actually a false statement, even though it's it's. Deceiving. It looks true because the math works, but the problem is they're saying that's the only answer that it could have been. It could only be a negative two, which is a false statement. Okay? All right, so it's false, no worries there. So we figured out that. So that's one part, that's one point right there. You told me if it's true or false. I will not pick something tricky. It'll be something very, very obvious that's true or false. Okay, you will not need any other work. It won't be something like this where that's kind of a trick question. Because most people look at it and say it's true. Okay, now the converse. All we have to do is switch the hypothesis and conclusion around. This is the hypothesis, this is the conclusion. All we have to do is flip flop. So if x is equal to negative 2, then x squared is equal to 4. Okay, so on this part here, the idea is that um, when you do a converse, that's the first part, this is the converse. All you do is switch the hypothesis to conclusion. Now, you also have to tell me if that's true or false. So, if x is a negative 2, so this is our starting number, when we square it, will that give us 4? Yes. Yes, this is actually a true statement, which is weird. Because they're, they're giving you the number to start with, which is different than up here, where you're trying to find what x is. They're starting with this, and they're saying, okay, when I square the x, will it give me 4? Yes, it will. So that's actually a true statement. So the converse could be true, even though the original statement was false. Didn't have to be. But it is. Okay, um, inverse. So, inverse. Inverse is taking the original sentence, the original sentence, which is this one, and then just negating both of them. That's what an inverse is. So, we're going to negate both parts. So, if x squared does not equal 4, then x does not equal negative 2. That's actually a true statement. If this doesn't work, like when you square x and it doesn't make 4, then there's no way that the number could have been negative 2. If it was negative 2, it would gain you 4. So, it's definitely, that's definitely a true statement when I negate both of them. And then the converse, or uh, the contrapositive, I should say, is where I flip this sentence, where I negate the converse. So the contrapositive is where I negate that one. So if x does not equal negative 2, then x squared does not equal 4. And that is also a true statement. Because if it's not two, negative 2, when I square it, it's not going to be 4. Because if it was, it would have worked out. The only potential way that that could be a false statement, that bottom one, the only way that this could this could be false, what if your answer was what if your answer was um, what if your answer was two? That that could make this actually a false statement. 
So I could actually see that. I could actually see that this could be false. Because just right here, it's kind of limiting you. Like, there's no way it could be four. There's one way it could be four. So, so that, then yeah, I could see that I could actually be false. That, that one right there. That's a little I'll give you something very clear cut. Okay, questions, comments about number five. Do you notice how many parts there are on that one? You had, you had tell me true or false in the original, converse, inverse, contrapositive, and then tell me if those are true or false. And it'll be something very, very simple. Like it will not be complicated, it will not be tricky. You will not have to spend a lot of time thinking about it. Okay. Any other questions here? Okay, we're gonna stop there, because I know we got about five minutes or so. Um, I'm gonna give you time where you can just kind of stop, um, kind of digest this. I know that we have a bunch of semester tests coming up next week, so if you need to study for that. Um, if you haven't turned in, um, I guess we've been really enough for a while, but if you have any other late work that you want to turn in, like stuff you still owe me, if you notice there's an LI in the grade book, still owe me something. Um, I think we'll be updating your guys' class tonight after school. So if you've turned in something, because I know some people have like redone an assignment and they turn it back in, those will be going this night. Okay.